All right, I'm um, going to go ahead and start recording going here. So uh, I guess it's time. Um, so hopefully everybody can hear me OK. I didn't get any feedback on that. And everybody can see my screen here. So as usual, I mean, my plan was just to go over the assignments, see if people had questions about it. So I thought I would review the last one um, and then talk about the next one, see if if anybody had a question about either of those. Um, and then um, later on, we can talk about the materials for chapter four or other things. So, um, so let me start with the third assignment, see if anybody wants to ask about that. So I did post um, solutions for that. Um, oh, by the way, yeah. So like I said in my announcement, uh, I still haven't gone back over those. I, I will go back and kind of change my rubrics on that. So it ended up being um, a little more points off than what I wanted. Um, although it is, I guess it, it was a little bit more, um, um, I was expecting more people to, to get the things, but uh, the, 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 the there's, there's basically only one or two things that people were getting wrong on that. Uh, just getting kind of the same thing wrong on all the questions. So uh, anyway, so I'll, 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 we'll get to that here. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I haven't, haven't got back to kind of re-going over those again. I'll have to try and get to that here real soon. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I have a lot to say about the first uh, four questions. Um, I mean, most people had most of those correct, but if, but feel free if, if you wanted to ask something specifically. Um, so, I mean, the first one, just in general, uh, you know, for a computer science degree, I hope people become comfortable with this if you haven't already, you know, kind of knowing uh, powers of two and, and translating uh, units and, you um, um, and, and, and these general kinds of things. So the idea that um, for, for specifically for computer architecture, you know, if, if, if um, somebody tells you that the system is 32-bit architecture or 64-bit architecture, or, you know, tells you what the number of bits are for the um, address field or the operand field, um, you know, that, that, that tells you kind of, what um, the, the ranges are of things uh, of what you can represent, you know, so um, I, Oh, um, yeah, there was one thing maybe I'll mention that I um, um, there, There's really kind of two ways of um, When people talk about, you know, like a kilobyte or a megabyte um, or a gigabyte or a terabyte um, Sometimes people are talking about powers of 10, right? So, you know, um, so, so a kilobyte by that definition would be um, um, 10 to the power of three um, or, or just a thousand, right? So that's, that's kind of like a metric kilobyte. If you look this up in Wikipedia, um, they call that the, uh, the ISQ standard uses power of 10, uh, but um, um, and there's a separate uh, standard uh, that uses powers of two. Um, the, um, oh, the oh yeah, the, the international system of, of units, the FI standard. That, that's the one that that normally defines those as powers of ten. So um, you know, like like uh, a thousand is would be a kilobyte, and then you know. Um, uh, 10 to the nine or, or a thousand cubed would be a gigabyte. So a thousand squared um, is a million bytes, um, that's a megabyte and a thousand cubed would be 10 to the nine and that's, and, and that's a, a gigabyte, right? Um, anyway, so, but, but normally if, if, if you're kind of talking to computer scientists or electrical engineers or, or computer architects, um, they're probably going to be meaning things of, in powers of two. Um, and for the most part for this course, 
um, unless I give a reason otherwise, you should probably be using a power of two because that makes much more sense, especially in a course like this for computer architecture, because we will be talking about things like um, parts of the computer architecture where, where, um, where we're talking about, say, the bit fields for the uh the the address or operands um or the uh the 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 um, um the, the, the architecture size or, or other things right so but but anyway so when you have number of bits um it's natural to specify things in in powers of two right and uh, the the reason why it's so these are close but not identical right and so this will actually confuse you sometimes if you look up the specification because like hard drive manufacturers often use uh, powers of 10 because it, it ends up being slightly bigger um, than um, if you use powers of, of two here. But anyway, so um, usually a computer scientist or a computer architect, if they say a kilobyte, uh, they really mean um, Uh, two to the power of 10. So that's that's really 1,024 bytes instead of 1,000 bytes, right? It's a little bit bigger. Um, and, um, and then, um, so, so these standards, though, again, it, it comes out that things are pretty close, but not exactly the same. So um, you can use um, uh, the, the square of that. So two to the 10 squared, um, becomes um, a megabyte um, or, or 1,024 squared becomes a megabyte. So that's a little bit more than a million. Um, and likewise, 1,024 cubed, um, which would be two to the 10 to the power of three is a terabyte and so on. Uh, um, so anyway, yeah, I mean, that, that kind of, um, uh, a lot of people actually did kind of uh, 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 get that, um, although, you know, people were specifying this just as gigabytes or exabytes without um, um, uh, maybe notice, notice, noticing this kind of distinction here. But, but, uh, but yeah, again, for, for this class, um, um, from this point forward, you know, if we talk about kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, we probably mean the, the power of two uh, standard usually. Um, oh, and by the way, yeah, so for 64-bit architecture, um, you actually have 16 exabytes of addressable memory space. So that, that's quite a bit bigger than 32 bits um, to the power of 60, uh, 64 versus to the power of 32. Is a, is a much larger address space. Um, so um, I, I actually, I mean, I, I was a little bit, um, I accepted a couple of different things um, on like questions two and three. I think so, um, because um, you can interpret things slightly differently and, and you know, it was fine the, the way some people interpret um, uh, the, 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 the basis of these questions here. So, um, so anyway, I mean, you know, the, the example answer that I gave might not be exactly what what you had, even if I accepted it completely. Um, but but yeah, I thought about this for problem two. Um, so this basically um, comes out to. I mean, so, so uh, the 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 general thing I was looking for is that. Um, but yeah, if, if you've got um, a clock speed uh, specified here for, for four megahertz, um, I mean, that basically means um, one over four million um, is your clock cycle speed, right? But, um, um, 
the way to interpret this problem is that um, Um, I mean, we are fetching um, two bytes um, every cycle here, uh, but um, you know, from from you know, so two bytes at a time. But from uh, careful reading of the question, um, um, is, is that um, we actually had to use two clock cycles for every um, uh, memory cycle, right? So, so um, I mean, given that, that means that uh, we can perform operations at really at two megahertz, right? Um, but we are fetching um, uh, two bytes each time, so. Um, anyway, so for the, the third question, again, I, I kind of allowed some uh, variation on interpretation there. Um, Um, yeah, and, and also, so uh, also for the fourth one, um, so some people calculated this um, slightly differently, so, so the percentage of uh, what? Um, um, basically, the, the, the taking the um, increase in um, um, The number of bits. Anyway, so this this is closer to uh, using like like Amdel's um, idea. So so the ratio of um, the the, the um, faster to the slower, right? Um, um, Right, um, and, uh, but yeah, I mostly want to talk about five then. Um, so let's get that up to. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of think that uh, five is a good problem. Um, so this is from our chapter three, define kind of a hypothetical machine. So, you know, um, the, the whole purpose of this course where we're talking about computer architectures, we're gonna kind of get into uh, the details of this, but it's very important that you understand kind of how the computer works at this level as was described in chapter three. So not only like the fetch execute cycle, but uh, also interrupts, um, and um, um, how those can be used um, for uh, and, and things like procedure calls and some other th stuff that was discussed in chapter three that we didn't really directly uh, test with this um, particular question. But um, 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 I probably should have brought up the figure of the um, um, architecture. Uh, let me bring that over here too while I'm thinking about it. So, um, if I can go back to that um, um, hypothetical machine here from chapter three. I guess that was right at the beginning. Um, so we'll talk you know, about instruction formats, um, addressing modes, um, 
and other things later on. But um, but so but it is important that that you kind of grasp this at this level um, at, at this point. You know, kind of the, the things that the hypothetical machine is trying to illustrate uh, here. Um, but you know, this is typical that that um, for whatever our architecture size is. Um, that we're going to have to represent instructions uh, using something like this. So, so, so of course, for real processors, and, and we'll be looking more like at real processors. Uh, so, specifically, Intel um, and ARM architectures uh, is what we'll mostly be looking at in this course. Um, but um, um, uh, in, in both of those cases, the instructions, you know, you divide them like this in the same kind of way. So, you, you have some number of bits are used for your opcodes um, and some number of bits for your dressing modes. And then there's other things as well. So it's more complicated than, than the simplified picture here. But um, um, but I probably mentioned this um, last week, maybe. But um, so for this, um, we, we, we kind of have a 16-bit architecture. Um, we're only using four bits for the opcode. So that means that what? We have to the power of four. Um, is our limit for the number of unique opcodes that we could actually define for this architecture, right? Which isn't a lot, right? So, um, um, so we could really only have 64, or sorry, uh, 16 to the power of four um, different opcodes like this, um, uh, different operations, right? Um, so like a typical, like, like uh, x86 has hundreds of opcodes just kind of for comparison. Um, yeah, and that also means that we've only got 12 bits for the address, um, so we can only have an address space of um, to the 12, like it says here, or, or a 4K memory is the maximum um, addressable memory here, just with this addressing mode, basically. So. Um, and the other thing I'll point out, so I did have two or three people, um, I don't know if, if uh, probably this was talked about in our um, um, 516 course a little bit. Uh, so, so one's complement and two's complement. So, so different ways of representing um, signed integers in, in the computer um, um, architecture, right? Um, pardon me for just a second. All right, sorry about that. I had to pause for a second. Um, so, um, yeah, two's complement. Um, so some people uh, look like they were uh, remembering or, or from either a, a course here or an undergraduate course, uh, which is good. So, so you know, I kind of want to point that out. So we're also going to be talking about uh, representing um, data types. Um, uh, so, so some data types have to be represented at the hardware level. Um, and common ones, of course, are numerical types. So both um, um, integer formats, so whole number formats, and floating point formats are the two most important ones. So, so we'll, have, we'll talk about those representations. And, and for a real computer, you know, we usually do use two, two's complement. So two's complement is used both for ARM and uh, Intel uh, um, assigned integer formats, right? But um, I'm, I'm kind of bringing this up because you know that that was like I said the, the, a lot of the problem was people I guess not understanding this or uh, you know so I had, I had people and I'm going to take off uh, points in different ways for this once I kind of go back over this here you know so some people uh, uh, even though you know we said that that all the values should be represented as hexadecimal numbers were just giving me like negative five or whatever um, when they came across a negative number in a calculation uh, of course another big one was not realizing that something um like um uh, that had a value with a one for the first bit so that would typically be something um that had like an eight um in hexadecimal or or an f so, so anything from eight to f for the first digit would mean um, that the first bit was a one, right? Because because all values 
bigger than eight have a have a one digit in the most significant one there. So for all of those, if that represents a data item, um, then that would be a negative number um, being represented uh, in that case. Right? So. Um, Um, I just want to, you know, say ag again on this that um, it, these are the kinds of things that uh, I, I guess if you want to get into a technical field, which I assume that, that you do, you know, being in a, a computer science master's program, um, I mean, it does help to be a little bit um, obsessive or a little bit detail oriented, you know, so, you know, exactly getting down to understanding uh, down at the bit level is going to help you on this course and, and really understand the layout and, and and then you know being able to um keep details like that in mind um a, a bunch of those um so, so for, for this case for, for this problem you know you had to be translating um uh, things that represent instructions using kind of the details the bit patterns given here Things representing uh, data. Uh, we only have integer data for this problem um, using this format and, and kind of what it means, um, uh, our signed format here. Um, so, so let's let, let me uh, look at the actual ones here. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, um, the, the numerical format was the biggest one. Um, one or two people weren't translating the instructions quite quite right, you know. So um, kind of like I showed in here, kind of my, my first thing when I did these pro problems by hand myself was to, you know, first translate um, all of the, the, the opcodes from binary that were given into decimal um, or, or into hexadecimal. Um, you know, so, so subtraction is a four, um, jump is a, um, a six, um, and, and jump on um, um, zero is a seven, jump on negative was an eight, right, and, and, and um, noting those. And then the others came from the, this textbook from like the um, add and store and then. Uh, um, So again, I mean, the, the most common one here, um, um, I, I was, so I was gonna say that the, the only one or two people, the, the other thing was um, um, most people were getting the add and subtracts correct, uh, you know, so the numerical operations, um, most people were getting the jumps correct. So, so these are an example of, of an instruction type that, um, um, that, um, um, manipulates the flow of control of the uh, fetch execute cycle instead of manipulating um, you know like the accumulators or some general purpose register it actually changes the program counter to, to manipulate where the, you know how the fetch execute cycle um, you know, plays out um, when we're executing a program right most people are getting that, uh, except for one or two, you know, manipulating the program counter for, for jump instructions and things. Um, so yeah, I mean, the only real big problem consistently on this one was not representing things in hexadecimal, you know, so, and, and again, so, so I guess that's kind of what I mean by details. So, so I mean, you knew that these were hexadecimal numbers because most people were interpreting these correctly. Um, 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 to break these apart, well, kind of, right? Um, or at least we're understanding how, that, that we had to translate the binary opcode into the first hexadecimal digit, um, and then the rest of the digits represented um, uh, some sort of a memory addressing um, portion of the instruction. But um, but yeah anyway so so when you added this you're going to get um, a ten decimal which is, which should have been a hexadecimal um, 
And in this case, you know, the, the program counter is no jump instruction. So the program counter just gets incremented, uh, which is the default. So, so we do sequential execution uh, by default um, in a computer program in, unless, you know, we explicitly have some loops or some, um, some, some function calls or some condition statements like if else statements. Um, Um, but but yeah, so in this case, um, we only had four, three fetch execute cycles before you couldn't really do, didn't know what to do after that because at this point it was trying to, have, to fetch from memory address through a three and we didn't have that one um, given to you in the problem. So. Um, So for the second problem, um, we start off with a subtract, um, which should have ended up with a value zero. Um, and this was the first one where we had to do a jump. Um, and again, like I said, you know, I, I was happy to see mo most people were understanding that that's a manipulation of the program counter. Um, and some people were, were doing jumps okay, but, but weren't quite getting the jump, the conditional jumps. So in this case, so this is common for conditional types of jumps. It's, it's going to be a test for uh, a value in a register. And our only register that we have that's used for calculations is the accumulator, right? So again, when we get into real CPU architectures, uh, normally you've got multiple registers, general purpose registers. Um, um, but, uh, but here we've just got one for doing calculations called an accumulator. Um, so in this case, the, the jump on zero is, is implying that it, it's basically testing the accumulator and, um, and so, so in the jump, so conditional jumps are how you execute or how you create both loops um, and um, like if else statements. So conditional statements in uh, higher level languages, right? So, so both a loop, uh, a loop, you need to have some sort of a test condition um, to be testing um, and it needs to be conditional so that you either continue, you know, like jump back up to the top of the loop and continue to do the loop or, or jump out of the loop. So that's a, an example of, of a conditional statement and that will get implemented as some sort of a conditional um, jump or a conditional branch um, at the machine architecture level, the, the uh, machine language level, um, when you compile it from a high level language into a um, into machine code, right? Um, or, or you can use, you know, conditional jumps for um, just branch, branch statements. So, so like uh, if state, if else statements. Um, um, so in this case, anyways, we're, we're going to always be the conditional ones that I added for you will always be testing the accumulator result. So here, if it's zero, we should um, end up modifying the um, program counter um, using the memory, um, or sorry, using the address portion of the um, operand uh, here. So this will push 300 into the program counter. Um, and then we will fetch from the program counter again. So this is an example of a, a small tight loop, right? So we're, we're, we're basically subtracting um, the value from the um, 941 from the accumulator until we hit zero, right? Or as long as it's zero, we're going to keep doing that, right? So, but I guess in this case, we only do it once, not, not exactly a loop, but um, Um, so, so the, the result would be that we would subtract um, two again from here. And again, you know, the representation. So we've got a value that's negative two. That should have been represented uh, with a one in the most significant bit, according to our uh, signed uh, integer format, which is just using a simple sign magnitude for this hypothetical machine. So that, that's a one in the most significant bit with all zeros, except for the last. Um, 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 uh, the second to last bit um, 
uh, to give a magnitude of two here. Um, uh, and, and then continuing on. So um, in this case, then when we execute the instruction uh, in 301, our, our jump on zero again, um, in this case, the jump won't occur since the result is non-zero. Um, so we'll just continue on sequentially to, to uh, instruction 302, um, which is a store. I think one person didn't do the store right, um, but most people got like the stores and the loads correct. So, uh, so in this case, yeah, we should end up with the negative two out here. And then after that, um, um, that was the end for this problem since you didn't really have, again, we were at address 303 at this point. So. Um, so here we were starting with a value that was negative three um, in the accumulator that you were supposed to add um, uh, two, two to get negative one. Um, And then we store that back out to um, um, uh, memory here. Um, and then a um, and then an absolute jump. So we had we had some conditional jumps um, and and an absolute jump. So an absolute jump always occurs. It doesn't make any kind of test, right? So in this case, we're going to have a, an infinite loop, um, always jumping back to um, uh, 300. So, so the kind of result of this is, is the, this loop will just keep um, adding um, two basically and, and then storing the result back out um, here to, to memory address uh, 940, right? So, um, so the second time through this loop, um, um, the value will get added. Um, so it'll go from negative one to positive one, um, and that should get uh, stored back out. Um, to there, um, and then at this point, uh, from the assignment instructions, you didn't have to do more than six fetch execute cycles. So um, at this point, we've jumped back to 300 again. So we'll, we'll, um, we'll keep doing that though. So you know, next time we would add two, and, and the result would go up to three, five, seven, nine, and so on. I guess problem four was similar, um, but again, um, um, you know, the main issue being um, the representation of negative numbers other than anything else, right? So here we have a value, um, uh, you know, whatever FC, so FC is close to 255, um, 250, a little bit less than 255, uh, FF would be 255. So, um, But yeah, so we're loading that value from 941 and then we're subtracting the value. So, so the result should immediately be zero, which most people had. Um, um, and, and again, we jump on zero. Um, so I guess this problem is kind of similar to the previous two, kind of a combination of those two. Um, but then when we subtract again, we're going to get a negative FC in this case. So um, 80 FC. Um, yeah, and at that point, um, our program count would be 303. We wouldn't have any more to do for this problem. Um, okay, yeah, so anybody? I'm going to ask any questions about the uh, third assignment, further ones.
Um, all right. And let's see, um, let's, let's bring up, let's stick with the assignment. So let's see if, um, if there are any questions about the uh, uh, assignment for this week then, um, assignment four, I mean, they clear up. Um, So for the first question, um, the programs end up with doing the same calculation, but they do it in slightly different ways. So one has two loops versus one has one, right? Um, so, so yeah, they will, if, if you think about some of the stuff that we talked about or that, that's talked about in chapter four anyway, um, you know, about hashing, um, there's a possibility that these would have greatly different performances here. Maybe not. It would depend on the size of cache, but um, but they could. Um. Um. So spatial and temporal locality. So we talk a lot about that. So um, I mean, you know, those two, I mean, certainly spatial is probably the, the easier to understand. Um, and of course they're related, right? So um, if things are um, lo located close together uh, in, in memory, so in space, um, we're likely to also end up needing to access them uh, about the same time if we're running a program, um, you know, to execute those if they're instructions or to access them if they're data, right? So, um, so lots of things will end up being both local spatially and uh, will end up um, having, you know, uh, being needed to be accessed um, close together in time as well. Um, but uh, yeah, we can talk some more about locality. I mean, it's a very important um, concept. Um, so, you know, that was one of the things, one of the big things in chapter four. Um, so. And then the rest of the questions, well, a lot of the rest of the questions, um, have to do with calculations about uh, um, of, of different aspects when we have cache memory, right? Um, both performance and cost. Um, so some of these are relatively simple. Like, like I think three is a pretty simple question. Um, but um, Um, for a lot of these questions, you know, we're, we're, we're using the, um, the, um, just to jump in here, we're using the, um, performance of caching, um, that I believe is in chapter four, where he, where he talks about it, um, Right. That's, that's what I was looking for. So the section four, chapter four. So um, I'll, I'll come back and uh, so I can maybe talk a little bit about um, this um, uh, in detail, uh, like the example here. So how how you calculate the effective access time for a uh, um, a basic two level memory. So where you have a cache in front of a, a larger, slower memory. So, but um, uh, you'll need this basic 
kind of uh, uh, format for quite a few of the, the questions there on assignment four. Um, 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 and, and yeah, if you multiply this out, so these are equivalent. So if you multiply that out, um, you get kind of that format, right? Which is what that one is there, I believe. So, um, All right, so I think that's all I can think of to give hints about or, or um, discuss at least for the um, fourth problem set here. Does anybody want to ask me about any of those questions? Everybody's looked at that and started working on those. Um, okay, well, so I think that um, I'm going to go ahead and maybe take a little bit of a break then. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's a little bit past eight here, so about uh. Uh, 805 or, or so, um, 806, um, we'll start back up. Um, I might not have too much longer tonight, so um, I'll go over, uh, uh, talk a little bit more in detail about the, the materials in chapter four here when we get back. So, all right, so let's, let's take about five minutes. Yeah. Okay, um, hopefully everybody's ready to start back up again. Um, so like I said, I don't know if, if I'll take too much longer here. Um, one note about the notes. Um, I noticed that, um, um, I, I don't know if, if the kind of my own reading notes are useful for people or not. Uh, I usually have links to those. Um, actually, there are notes about the uh, the this chapter's memory hierarchy, but they're oh, they're in um, um, they're kind of combined with um, the uh, the the uh, the unit five. So if you go look in the chapter five notes, if anybody finds those useful, uh, because yeah, it's, um, I need to update my notes, but uh, I, I took these when. Um, Using like the tenth edition, and he like split uh, the chapter four into separate uh, or chapter five into separate chapters. Um, so anyway, kind of uh, a lot of the material that we're talking about here uh, about uh, on the memory hierarchy um, is actually kind of in the notes. If, if anybody's interested in getting those, um, so in particular. Um, uh, he did have, I, I did have all that material about um, you know, the memory hierarchy and um, the uh, performance. Um, talk about how you calculate performance for a memory hierarchy and um, the locality principle and things like that. So. Um, So next week we'll get into the details of cash actually. So I mean, especially things like um, uh, types of cash and um, associated versus um, um, direct mapping and, and other things. So. Um, Anyway, 
probably just going to look through the sections of chapter four. So, um, so yeah, one of the things they did have in the 11th edition is he kind of added in the section and emphasized more the discussion about the principle of, of, of locality. Um, So this is an important thing to you know make certain that you understand, right? Um, I, I think I've said it before in this class. I mean, it should make sense to you um, because the way that we um, implement programs in a computing system uh, is, um, I'm sure I've said this before in this class. You know, so uh, uh, so the the fetch execute cycle. Um, is the normal way that we execute programs. Um, and so when we're doing that, we're executing instructions uh, sequentially uh, normally. So except for when we get the branches and, and um, loops and things, but, but by far the majority of the instructions, we execute them in sequence, one after the other, right? So whenever you're ex executing code, you're likely to need the next instruction after the one that you just currently that you're currently executing right so that's that's an example of locality right um and the same argument intuitive argument can may, be made for data as well you know so we tend to organize data um like an like an array so so or tables right um and so normally when we need a piece of data um the other data around it um, uh, spatially uh, we will need as well for a calculation you know i think i think it's maybe uh, you know that's less true of, of data locality so so i i suspect that i should probably look this up if this is true or not so uh, data locality is probably not quite as um um strong as instruction locality right because again you know when we're executing instructions um uh, by by far you know um, we will be executing things sequentially right but the data is more varied um so, so a lot of times we are going to be um processing data sequentially like going through an array or something uh, but, you know, you can think of lots of other cases where you need to access data more randomly, random access, uh, you know, move things around, um, um, and that, that means that locality is lessened um, when you're doing things sort of non-sequentially to process data, which can have performance implications for these caching systems, which is one of the things that, um, um, if you didn't know about before, uh, that you should kind of understand as a result of reading this chapter from our textbook, right? So the whole reason why a cache can work in a computing system is because um, things tend to be uh, um, referenced uh, local to one another, right? And because of that, that means that uh, that uh, if we have a, ca a fast cat a fast cache uh, that that's small and fast um, in front of um, a slow bigger memory um, um, things will work out in, in terms of, of being able to use that to maintain performance uh, because when we need to access something that we don't have in our cache, so we have to go to the slower memory and fetch it. Um, if we just fetch, um, you know, if we fetch more than what we need, so, so if we fetch a block of, of, of stuff uh, around the thing that we actually need, we're likely to need that other stuff that we fetch incidentally uh, when we're fetching the one specific thing that we need, right? Because of this pr principle of locality. And, the, and you know, locality tends to be so strong that we can maintain a relatively high hit ratio in our cache. And if your cache is much faster than the, the, the slower memory that it's a cache in front of, um, you know, that, that high hit ratio because of, of this locality principle uh, means that most of the time, 
um, um, we'll be fetching things from cash, right? So, so most of the time it'll be as if um, we only need that the, the, the very fast cash memory um, instead of uh, most of the stuff actually being stored in the slower uh, main memory. So. Sorry, I mean, this is all important stuff to understand both intuitively, um, but also to be able to calculate, um, um, you know, what the expected performance is when, when you have a caching systems like this. So at least, at least as a kind of a, um, a rule of thumb, um, back of the envelopes or calculations for performance. So. All right, sorry. Oh, yeah. So he even laid out exactly the same things that I'm discussing here. So the the kind of the intuitive arguments for um, locality. Um, like I said, so temporal and spatial localities are certainly going to be uh, related. Um, but yeah, one one's referring to um, where um, you know spatial locality is referring to things that. In, in memory are located close together. Um, and temporal locality is, is referring to the tendency that that the um, that the instructions that we're executing or the data that we're processing, if we access it, accessed it um, relatively recently. And so if we just accessed it, um, we're likely to need it again in the future. And so those are slightly distinct, right? So temporal locality um, means that um, often it's the case that, uh, so, so if we have a big program, um, it's the case that over a given shorter period of time, we're probably only gonna be processing a sub portion of that program, so executing um, a, a small bit of that portion, or or processing a small bit of data of that program. Right? Over time, that 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 that's 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 the concept of what's known as a working set. Um, so over time, the, the parts of the program that we're referencing um, temporarily might change. So, so later on, once we're done processing uh, one particular bit, we might move on and do some different calculations, and that would end up needing a different working set of instructions and data uh, to process. Um, uh, but again, you know, these are definitely going to be, you know, related. Right? Um, Uh, let's go let's go over to the sec the next section here. Uh, right, so um, section two then um, is kind of just an overview of all the various things, um, the, the the characteristics, you know, the the, the different attributes of the memory system. Um, so we can talk about all of these, um, although you know I'll probably skip over some of these. Um, but um, let me just make a comment about a few of these. So, so the, the, the one thing, uh, an important aspect, uh, we do tend to divide memory into um, two broad categories: so internal versus external. Right. So internal are the um, things that um, are directly accessible by the CPU, okay? So these are gonna be the things that are defined in the, into the computer architecture uh, that are part of the, um, uh, you know, basically the defined address space, right? So, so when we have the computer architecture, um, we have our uh, size of the computer architecture, 32 bits, 64 bit, 
um, and we will define um, our addressing modes in the computer architecture that we'll talk about, um, and we'll have some number of bits for different kinds of addressing modes. Um, but, but all of those will give some sort of a characteristic about things that can be directly addressed by the, the, um, the CPU, right? So basically everything from the registers down to what we would call main memory through uh, nowadays through several levels of cache um, is going to be considered internal memory, um, right? And it's internal basically because normally there's going to be addressing modes in the CPU uh, that you can basically throw up a referenced address onto the bus um, and that will resolve to you know cache or, or a location in RAM main memory um, to, to read or write that data um, directly from it right uh, and then everything um, outside of that so is going to be what we think of as external the computing system, external memory. So this is basically your um, I.O. devices. Um, so, so we normally have to access that stuff indirectly um, through I.O. devices, I.O. drivers. And um, yeah, so you know, we'll talk about um, a little bit more of these detail, you know, like um, the, the technologies to implement internal memory versus the technology to, to implement external memory on IO devices um, in chapter six and seven. So. Um, so of course the, the, the fundamental thing about each of these um, one of the fundamental things is the capacity. So how much um, data or, um, or, or program um, you can hold on each of those. That, that's the, the, the capacity. Um, and as we've mentioned before, the, um, you know, so the, the word size has pretty much standardized to be a byte um, for most computer architectures that are common nowadays. So, so we measure things capacity in terms of uh, bytes, typically, um, you know, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes of, of memory. So. Um, Although, you know, I'm sure our textbook discusses this here. Um, when, when people talk about the, the, the word size of the computer, um, there's some, people mean different things by that. Um, um, so um, another way of thinking about the word size is, is kind of the, the typical um, uh, unit of transfer uh, for internal memory, right? So, so in that case, the, the, the number of bits in the architecture um, tends to be kind of what we mean by the word size uh, when we're thinking about that. So for 32-bit machines, 32-bit architectures, uh, we'll tend to transfer 32 bits or four bytes at a time back and forth. Um, between the CPU and the uh, different levels of the internal memory. For 64-bit uh, machines, the, the word size, you can kind of think of it effectively as 64 bits or, or 8 bytes. Right? Um, so that's another thing that, that is kind of defined by the number of bits of the architecture, 32-bit versus 64-bit or some other bit size for the architecture. You know, so typically on 64-bit machines, we're, we're moving things around internally um, 64 bits at a time or, or, um, or um, eight bytes at a time. Um, and that's, this is another big difference between internal and external uh, located data. You know, so externally, we tend to move things 
in bigger chunk sizes, so in block sizes, right? So typically our um, hard drives and things um, will use like 512 byte uh, blocks or 512 byte sectors or maybe one kilobyte size blocks or sectors, um, some variation in that. But, but yeah, whenever we need to move something to or from external memory, normally we'll get like a block, which is you know, bigger than, than um, 32 bits or 64 bits. Um, so typically like 512 or 1K um, block sizes. Um, Another big distinction between internal and external. So almost, not, not almost, so, so all of the um, memory technologies for internal memory um, are gonna be random access. So what that means, or what we mean basically by random access is that um, um, there's gonna be no difference uh, in access time uh, to get values uh, at different portions of the address space, okay? So the time to access the value at address space zero um, is the same as the time to access the value at whatever the, the maximum address, the last address is in the address space for random access and all memory locations in between have basically a constant um, um, for a particular level of internal memory uh, for, for random access memory. Um, so unlike that, so typically for external devices, they don't work randomly. They, they don't, they don't um, um, support random access. Uh, they support um, um, sequential or um, direct access. Um, so, um, although that's you know not quite as true anymore uh, because um, um, nowadays we've got um, sound state devices that we consider as external memory, um, and those actually can be. Um, directly or randomly accessed. Uh, but anyway, for typical like um, magnetic drives, um, um, so, so think of your typical um, hard drive that's using magnetic technology. And again, it's something we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the details uh, in later chapters here, if you're not familiar with them. but. Um, um, in this case, you know, we, we've got data on a rotating platter, right? So to access a piece of, of data on the, the platter, we have to uh, position um, a read write head on the right um, cylinder. So that kind of moves it in and out from the, the center of, of a rotating media. And then uh, once we position, position it on the right cylinder, we have to wait uh, for the right track to rotate underneath the head, right? Um, but yeah, in that case, you know, to access the first byte on a track um, um, will happen faster than to access the, the last byte. You know, so we have to wait for those things to rotate past to read them in. So, so anyway, so there's different access times. So, so not everything is uh, like a fixed time like you get from random for, for direct and sequential. Um, and, um, and we'll talk about like associated memory in more detail. Okay, I'll, I'll leave that for the next chapter here when we talk about different kinds of caching schemes. So. Um, And then, yeah, the rest of these, I don't know if there's any need to go into the details right now here. You can read about 
do the other thing. So, you know, so um, maybe one, so, so looking at the physical type, you know, so, so another, what used to be a pretty hard distinction was that, you know, all internal memory was um, solid state semiconductor based, and then all external memory was uh, magnetic or some sort of magneto, magneto optical technology, right? That distinction is being blurred a little bit because we're now getting kind of um, um, solid state, um, which is semiconductor based, uh, our, our technologies are being used more and more for uh, what we would normally think of it as external memory. So your USB drives are solid state drives. They're not uh, magnetic or optical based. Um, and your solid state drives, SSD D drives, which are becoming more common as, as a type of external memory, but those are semiconductor based. So well, anyway, yeah, we don't we don't quite have that hard distinction that like we used to just five or so years ago. Um, um, so we're getting more and more options of things that we would consider external that work as external devices, but are based on um, semiconductor technologies. Um, oh, but this is another one uh, uh, again, uh, and this is this is still um, a characteristic where the internal external divide um, is a different. So, so most of these, all of the technologies that we consider for internal memory, are all volatile. Um, so these are really only temporary storage in that sense, right? So they they're only valid as long as we keep power to these technologies. And as soon as you remove power, um, they, they forget everything that you have stored in them, right? Um, so, so all of these are, are, are volatile. And, and, and all of these technologies tend to be um, um, era you know, uh, erasable, right? There are a few internal memory things um, that are not erasable, so ROMs and PROMs and things that, that are used as part of a typical computing system usually for booting it up. So, so um, uh, storing some of the BIOS instructions for boot up and things like that. Right. But, but most of the, 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 the stuff that we're talking about um, is, it needs to be erasable. So you need to be able to read, read and write. You need to be able to write stuff into it as well as read the stuff back out. Um, um, but external devices um, tend to be where we need it to be stored permanently. So they need to be non-volatile, right? So um, um, all of your magnetic and optical technologies um, are permanent because you, know, you, you flip a magnetic um, portion of the medium um, and it pretty much stays at you know, how you flip it you know, to be on or off. Same with optical, but using lasers to um, um, uh, flip a part of the medium to, to represent a bit. So, um, but yeah, I mean, solid state dri drives and USBs are also, you know, um, uh, non-volatile. So they have to use uh, a slightly different solid state uh, semiconductor technology uh, in order to be um, non-volatile to, to keep the stuff you write on them even when the power is removed right so all right um so yeah let me, let me then say a few words about the memory hierarchy here. Um, so kind of the, of, the, of the things that I was talking about here, I mean, there's kind of a dividing line um, right here. So, so everything up above here is kind of the internal, what, what we would normally think of as internal memory. Um, everything below here then um, is your external uh, memory, right? Um, so why, why do we have a, the, the, a memory hierarchy at all, right? 
So, um, um, and, you know, that's discussed in this chapter here when you, when you, in this section of the chapter here, when you read it. Um, if there, if there was a perfect memory technology that was um, cheap, that, that, that was fast um, and was cheap to have a large amount of it. So if we had one perfect technology that, that, was, that was very cheap, but we had lots of it and it was as fast as the CPU, as fast as um, you know, typical um, semiconductor um, um, access time, clock rates, then we would just use that memory and, and we, wouldn't use, we wouldn't have to have uh, a big um, hierarchy of, 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 of different types of computer memory. Uh, but unfortunately, there is no perfect memory. So if we built everything uh, using the same technology as the CPU, the semiconductor um, uh, uh, etching technology, um, so and, and that's, you know, the registers um, on the CPU chip um, are, are built out of that, as well as kind of caches uh, as well, although it uses a slightly different um, technology, SRAM, EDRAM, um, that we'll talk about here. Um, but, but yeah, if we built all of our memory, um, you know, the, the, and so nowadays we need gigabytes of memory typically, you know, four gig, eight, eight gig, 16 gig, more for a typical personal computer. Um, so so this, is, this memory is very fast, but it would, it would end up exploding the cost of the system to build um, all of the memory that we typically need out of that. Right. So, you know, all of a sudden, you know, personal computers, um, um, if you did that, would have to cost hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. So orders of magnitude more expensive. Um, um, so, um, so I like to think of it um, that, that the memory hierarchy is kind of an engineering kludge, right? It, it's, it's just a, um, um, because of this reality that there's no perfect memory technology, um, it would be too expensive to, to make computers with just um, um, this kind of technology. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the hard drives and things are way too, so, the, so every level as you go down uh, up here, and, and this is discussed here, you know, so these are the, the characteristics moving to the uh, memory hierarchy so things are very expensive to build at the top here and they get cheaper and cheaper as you go down here right and because the cost decreases um, um so you can typically only build a, a small amount of memory at the top here um and your cost per bit is going to be decreasing so it, it's a lot less expensive to have large amounts of um hard drive memory or solid state hard drive memory or magnetic disk hard drive memory, right? But unfortunately, the stuff is a lot slower, um, the, the technologies to access it. Um, so that necessitates that we have to have all these because uh, the, 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 this memory, so if we only use this for our memory, uh, 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 you know, typically our hard drives are, um, many orders of magnitude slower to read and write values in and out of them than what the CPU cycle, CPU clock runs at, right? So that would effectively mean, you know, if we're only using magnetic disks for all of our memory access reads and writes, um, the CPU would be constrained to run at the speed of our hard drives, which is, you know, just in terms of, you know, just un like, hundreds of bytes per second or thousands of bytes per second um, are, are typical down here at the magnetic disk speed versus, you know, giga, gigahertz um, and uh, processor speeds. Um, so that, that also would make computers effectively useless um, if we only had kind of the slow memory to be able to build computing systems. 
So the compromise is to have lots of different kinds of memory, and, and there's a bewildering kind of, of, of very variety of computer memories in the typical computing system in order to get over this uh, memory bottleneck, right? So this is called the memory bottleneck. I'm sure our chapter um, talks about this. So, so because all of these are, are much slower than typical CPU system uh, speed, uh, CPU processing speed ability, um, uh, uh, we have to build in all these different kind of levels of, of different types of memory in our computing system. Um, and none of this would work if the principle of locality didn't hold, right? So I already talked about this a little bit, right? But because of the principle of locality, that means that we can build effective caching systems, right? And then all, all of these, you can think of caching systems, but, but it's a multi-level caching hierarchy. So uh, um, Registers can be thought of as working as, as a type of cache or cache, right? And not shown here, but, but discussed. So, so for a typical computing system, we have more than one level of cache. So um, our CPUs typically have at least three levels of cache nowadays as standard. And so called level one, level two, and level three cache. Um, and then level three cache works as a uh, cache for main memory. So that's our RAM, uh, random access memory. Um, and then RAM acts as a, a cache for the external um, IO device uh, memory and so on. Right? Um, So yeah, so there's some figures in here illustrating kind of um, uh, these things here. Um, but um, kind of one final thing here um, that I'll talk about then is the uh, performance. Uh, but yeah, yeah, so this chapter goes into kind of a, lot, a lot more detail of all these things. Um, Um, oh, sorry, uh, I kind of want to. So you can, you can understand kind of the, the performance um, of, of a caching system, um, you know, so start with just a, just a, Kind of theoretical two level uh, of cache. So, you know, kind of as most basic, you can think of this as any of those two levels in a, in a real computer hierarchy. But, um, so, but, you know, think of this as like um, uh, a level of cache in front of, you know, a level of fast cache in front of slow main memory, right? As kind of the most basic example. Um, So in a system, so they, the, um, in this example from the textbook, they, they put some um, numbers on this. And this is typical, right? So, um, um, so, so T1 and T2 represent the access time for our two uh, caching levels, um, so for our two different um, memory uh, technologies that are being used for this, this caching system here. Um, and, and typically, at each level um, tends to be about an order of magnitude difference. Um, and um, I mean, that, that's kind of for a reason, you know, so if uh, once, once you have an order of magnitude level of difference in performance, uh, it begins to become cost effective uh, to use that other type of technology to build um, a memory system, right? So yeah, something like this, you know, so, so maybe the cache runs at a hundredth of a microsecond 
Um, so that means, uh, so here, you know, think of this as, as a random access memory for both of these um, um, levels here. Um, but our faster memory works um, uh, 10 times faster or, or an order of magnitude faster than our slower memory. So maybe, you know, a hundredth of a microsecond um, for our, the cache and a tenth of a microsecond for the main memory. Right? I mean, if, if this is random access, that means that um, if my word is in cache, um, I can access it 10 times faster. You know, it, it just takes a hundredth of a microsecond to read it um, or write it. Right? But if it's not in cache, I'm, I'm instead going to have to go to my slower memory to read or write the value. So it takes it's 10 times slower to do that. And then that's where the principle of locality and uh, the hit ratio comes in um, for uh, a simple two level caching system here. So for example, um, the, the hit ratio, um, it, we just specify as a number. So um, you can think of that as a percentage or as a ratio from zero to one, right? So if we have 100% hits, if our hit ratio is 100%, which would be a 1.0 hit ratio, right? So 100%, um, the, the, the hit ratio is the number, the percentage of time that we find it in the faster memory in this case, right? So if it's 100%, then we only need to ever access the level one, the faster memory. So the, in that case, the effective access time would be the T1, the faster one, the, the hundredth of a microsecond. Yeah. Um, but um, on the other end, then, you know, to, to you know, finish out this example here. Um, so when it's a miss, I mean, um, you have to take some time to determine whether it's a hit or a miss, right? So the access time um, for when it's a hit um, includes that time to determine whether the, the value was in the cache or not, the faster cache, right? But if it's a miss, um, you know, we, we first have to uh, check the cache uh, to determine that it was a miss, right? So, so when a miss happens, you know, we're first accessing the faster memory. We, we determine, we, we find out that it's a miss. So, so we have to spend the um, hundredth of a microsecond in this case, uh, determining that it's a miss. And at that point, then we're gonna have to access the slower memory. So that's why it's, it's a hundredth plus uh, a tenth of a microsecond here. So we really have to combine um, uh, an access on the faster memory with an access on the slower memory to determine it's a miss, to transfer the data from the slower memory to the faster memory, um, um, and then um, have that data available that we need here, right? Um, so anyway, uh, if our hit ratio was zero or zero percent, that would mean that we always have to access the value from um, the slower memory. Right, so that, that would mean that we would always have to do T1 plus T2 since we're using um, a, a two level cache here, right? And we're always having to check cache, always finding some miss. So, so every, you know, the effective access time uh, for a 0% or zero um, hit ratio um, is T1 plus T2. Um, but, and then to access anything for where the hit ratio is somewhere between zero and one or 0% to 100%, it's just gonna be a linear combination. It's just gonna be a weighted average of those two, right? Which is why you end up with a line, which show here, right? So, um, so, so really this, this here is just a weighted average, right? So if the effective um, hit ratio is, um, 95 percent or 0.95. A weighted weighted average would just you know take 0.95 times the uh, uh, hundredth of a microsecond 
plus um, the, the missed ratio, which is one minus the hit ratio. So 0 0.05 times the axis time for the slower, which you have to combine the two here for a caching system, right? If we calculate that out for a 95% hit ratio, you get um, 0 0.015 microseconds. But um, notice that um, you know this is a much closer um, effective access time to the fast um, the, the, the faster memory access time than it is to the slower one, right? So this is only fifty percent slower than um, the access time for our uh, uh, the, you know, the, the fast portion of memory here, right? right. So much closer. And, and that's, that's typical. So, um, so uh, what I'm getting at is that, um, you know, typically, again, because of the principle of locality, um, so when we have a miss, you know, we don't just transfer one value from the slower memory to the faster memory. So when we have a miss, we're going to transfer that value plus a block of values. So, so the values around it into our cache. And we'll talk more about that, you know, um, in the next chapter here, how you, how you do that. But because of the principle of locality, 95% um, hit ratio um, or, or better is pretty typical. So, so, so even 96, 97, 99% um, is, is not too tough to attain um, as your, um, your hit ratio. And when you have that, when you have 95% or, 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 or even better, um, your effective access time is going to be much closer to the faster memory than to the slower memory um, for this two-level memory here, right? And, and that's, that's important. That, that's all important. You know, because of the, the principle of locality, we can build caching systems like this. And because of the principle of locality, we can expect to be able to maintain hit ratios that are high enough so that the effective access time is closer to the faster memory, even though we've got lots of levels of slower memory, um, or, or well, two levels um, so far that we've been talking about here. So even though the slower memory is an order of magnitude slower here, the effective access time for this caching system is pretty close to our faster level of, of, of memory here, right? Um, so, Um, and, and you know that that does depend on locality, right? So, um, um, and, and luckily for us, because of the way that we organize programs and write programs, they tend to have relatively strong locality, which which gives high hit ratios, which makes caching, you know, this this memory hierarchy kludge possible, right? So when locality tends to be lessened, um, you know, that has a um, a um, impact on the hit ratio for caching systems, um, and that reduces performance. Um, well, kind of one final thing. I mean, you know, I wanted to make certain that that people do understand that 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 you can extend this idea. Then, you know, like, like calculating the effective access time to multiple levels. So I don't know if he does this explicitly in this chapter. I can't remember. Um, but um, let me just make up a quick example. Um, so, So 
Um, so hopefully you can see, uh, switched over to um, um, pen and uh, pencil here. Um, so for example, I mean, kind of ex extending that, let, let's say that we have a system with a level one cache, a level two cache, and then a main memory um, that I'll call uh, level uh, M. Uh, or RAM, right? And I'll use the same numbers just because I don't want to do too much calculations. But, but let's say that um, between level two and level M was the same as what we were talking about before. So we've got um, the, the, the time for level two, uh, the effective access time is the uh, 0 0.01 microseconds. Um, you know, another thing that, that um, I'm sure he probably talks about in this chapter. So, so also, you know, um, these levels uh, of cash, you know, the, the uh, usually the um, the times are going to differ by uh, order of magnitude or greater. Uh, but also, you know, the, the size, you know, the, the, the size of memory. So, so typically, um, like uh, our level two cache is going to be much, much smaller. Than, than memory because it's much more expensive to build uh, these faster things. So, so um, we can't make as much of it or else it would cause the price of the system to increase, right? So again, typically, you know, so we'll, we'll have like megabytes of, of our highest level of cache uh, to be a cache in front of gigabytes of um, main memory, typically, right? Um, and let's say, you know, so it's not always exactly one order of magnitude. So let's say that our time for level one is um, uh, five hundredths of a microsecond or something like that, right? Um, and then the other thing to know, though, is that um, when you have multiple levels, is um, you can have different um, um, hit ratios depending, and you know your hit, your hit ratio is going to vary depending on the relative size of the cache to the level that is caching and, and other factors, right? So, um, for example, our um, hit ratio for level one. Caching level two, let, let's, again, let, let's say that this one's higher. Let's say that that's 99%, 0.99. Uh, whereas our hit ratio for two, we'll say is the, the 0.95, right? Um, so, you know, the, the question then for something like this is so, what is the effective access time? Uh, for the system overall. So, so what does the access time look like uh, for, for the thing that's below the level one cache to get data in and out of, of this three level um, memory hierarchy here, right? Um, and uh, I mean, you know, you could, um, Um, I mean, you, you could you could plug in the numbers and, and come up with a formula for the the total of you know the effective access time for three level cache, four level cache, something like that if you wanted to. But but you, you know you can you can work this out kind of from first principles because I mean the basic idea is that if you if you calculate the access time, let's say for the level two uh, to level main memory cache, then you can just consider that as the effective access time for this block and then use that to ca calculate the effective access time for level one with the combined effective access time for level two to level n, right? So um, since I left these numbers the same, we already saw that, that the uh, effective time, I'll call that the effective time for level two um, m um, is um, the, um, um, you know, our formula is, is the hit ratio of level two times um, um, 
the T oh um I probably I probably shouldn't have used T1, T2 um, because that's gonna right. confuse with the previous example here. Um, but um, in this case, so I want it's, it's the hit ratio times the what I call T2 here, the, the, the time effective time for level two. Um, plus the, the, the miss ratio or the one minus the hit ratio times the combined of the uh, T2 plus Tm, right? But, but again, you know, that, that would just give the same numbers that we had before from our textbook. So that was um, um, 0 0.015 microseconds, right? So that, that's still our effective access time for this level. Of, 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 um, of our now of our three level memory hierarchy. So given that, I mean, you know, we can just plug that in here and do the same calculation to find the overall effective access time, right? So the overall effective access time is simply, you know, the 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 um, uh, in this case, it's going to be the um, hit one ratio times the, the time one. Uh, plus the, the miss ratio or the one minus the hit one ratio times the um, here though you know we do need to add in um, 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 all of these right so um, so you know so so this normally we, we would say t one plus Two, um, but um, the uh, the access time um, is a combination of these, right? So um, So, uh, oh, but um, so what I was, yeah. So uh, what this comes into is that um, we need to use the effective access time, right? So, so the, the 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 time two for this level is effectively what we just calculated. So that that's that's where it comes in. Um, um, so, so our effective access time for the two uh, in in level, right? Which was the point zero one five microseconds, right? Um, so that would allow you to um, calculate um, what the effective time overall is for the system. Um, so in this case, it would be the um, 0 0.005 plus 0 0.015. Right? Um, and um, I won't get my calculator out and do that. So, but but if, if you do that, if you calculate those out, you know, again, we could end up with something pretty close to the 0 0.005 here, especially since I kind of up the hit ratio at this level down here. Maybe, maybe I will just calculate this out because I think this might be the last thing that I'll say today here. So, in this case, we get. Uh, 99 times 0 0.005 plus uh, 0 0.1 times uh, 0 0.02. So if I did that correctly, um, um, an effective access time of 0 0.00515. So again, because we up the, the hit ratio here, um, it's, it's even closer. It's only 15% bigger than the actual um, access time for our um, level one last year. Um,
Okay, so but but and, and again, anyway, so you can extend that, and that that basic idea does extend um, through all the the levels of hierarchy that we would have on a typical computing system. Um, and um, you know, that's kind of why that uh, um, we can get around the memory bottleneck. You know, so, so, so as long as we have locality of reference and can maintain. Um, relatively good high enough hit ratio, um, the effective access time overall for, for you know, even, even a big multi-level um, system, a memory hierarchy system like this, um, will be like our uh, uh, fastest level of crash here. And um, um, because this works and because you know the, it would be very expensive to to make large amounts of these very fast things but because caching works uh, we can still get relatively good effective access times uh, with relatively small um, caches at these levels that are close down to the CPU um, All right, let me think. So um, I think that that should certainly, hopefully, be enough um, uh, to help you with the problems for this fourth problem set. And I'm Yeah, so um, I, think, I think we'll go ahead and stop there. Does anybody uh, give a last chance for questions here? So if anybody wants to ask about anything at all, any assignments or anything. All right, um, well, you know, if not, um, um, if not, I guess that's it for the session then. Um, you know, so let me know if you have questions by email um, um, or, um, or I'm, you know, I'm always happy to meet with people if people need to meet with things. Um, so at, uh, um, I haven't been announcing about, um, um, you know, whether I was going to be in the classroom or not. But um, um, probably next week, I'll, I'll try to, to to do the session in the classroom in case anybody wants to um, um, uh, needs to meet face to face then, um, or for my office hours. So generally, my office hours are Tuesdays and Thursdays in the afternoon. Uh, or uh, kind of in the morning up to around noon ish or so. So, um, all right. So I uh, will go in in there and um, have a good night. I'll see you guys later then.